Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to be in Ruth 4 today, and I have a little bit of exciting news today, or whatever day you're watching this. Uh, anyway, this video is going to be the last video that we do before we start meeting in person again uh, for YC. So that's exciting. Y'all can can applaud a little bit if you want. If you made it this far, hey, you've made it through what? March, April, May, June. Wait, really? March, April, May, June. Four and a half months uh, without being together in YC. And finally, within the next couple of weeks, we'll have a different video maybe for that uh, of saying what YC is going to look like. But this is the last lesson video that we will have before we meet together uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, I think I may have already mentioned we're finishing up Ruth chapter 4 which concludes the entire book of Ruth. And uh, in Ruth chapter 4, two things are pretty clear. That God is good, and his timing is always perfect. Last week we read this, this interesting story of Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor, where Ruth comes to Boaz when, when he was sleeping, and in a sense, she proposes to him. Now we know that nothing sinful happened, both acted righteously and pursued purity, and they serve as a, a wonderful example for us today. So today we're going to see how everything wraps up here in the last chapter. And so uh, what's funny though is that in, in a book called Ruth, Ruth is not the primary person that is in this chapter. Boaz, he takes on the starring role, but really it is God's providence, it is God himself that is on uh, display. So what we're going to see later on is that God is so perfect in his timing and the way that, that events unfold, that, that it is just unimaginable just how perfect he is with his timing. So we don't always see what it is that God is doing or understand why God allows things to happen when he does, but we will be able to see his good purposes in everything that happens. And so hopefully this lesson is a little bit shorter. Uh, probably won't be. I don't know why I ever advertised them as that. So what can you do? Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, all of Ruth 4 for us. Actually, just verses uh, 1 through 17. Which, is that the whole book? Yes, yes it is. So, never mind. All right, so <laughs> I'm on a roll right now. That's great. All right, so Ruth 4, verses 1 through 17. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. Remember last week, uh, Boaz had said that there was a uh, Redeemer that was before him who could redeem Ruth, but he was going to go talk to... Uh, this other redeemer and basically just tell him of the situation. So anyway, that's what's going on. Uh, so Boaz said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who had come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also require Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought the, from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that belonged to Chilion and to Milan. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. 
He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse, and the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. All right, so remember how last week, uh, and, and just a little bit earlier, I mentioned that uh, Boaz was a man that we never see in an unrighteous moment of any kind. Now, this isn't to say that he was perfect, but the way that he is portrayed here and in the narrative shows us a God-fearing man that longs to pursue righteousness. We talked last week about how Boaz, he didn't let his passion overcome him when it came to dealing with Ruth. He knew that she loved him, he loves her, but he handles everything righteously. Even though he wants to be her redeemer, he knows that he is not next in line to be the redeemer. So he is willing to act righteously, that he is able to say to Ruth in, in Ruth 3 that if the other redeemer redeems her, then she should let that happen. He's willing to let that happen. He was willing and able to push aside his own personal feelings in order to pursue what was right. So right here in chapter 4, Boaz does everything that he said he would do. He does what Ruth asked him to do. He goes to the redeemer and makes him aware of the situation, and he doesn't hide any of the details. He also brought together 10 elders of Israel to witness what was happening because he wanted to be known that this matter was dealt correctly. So there's no reason for Boaz to get 10 elders, but he wanted official witnesses there to witness to what was going on. So once the other redeemer realizes that not only does he have to redeem the land, he has to redeem Ruth, he backs out of the deal. Now I think this is largely due to the fact that Ruth was a Moabite. And we get this, or we get a hint of this in verse 6 when the man says that if he redeems it for himself, it's going to mess up his own inheritance. So once everything is dealt accordingly, Boaz becomes the redeemer of Ruth and she becomes his wife. But he didn't do it until he knew that he would, had done it correctly and righteously. So what is the, one of the big lessons that we can learn from what Boaz does here? If you're going to do something, do it correctly. And we can, we can actually add to that. And, and all that you do, act correctly. Now, I don't mean follow the instructions and in getting a, a question correct on a test or a quiz or something. I mean that in everything that you do, you act righteously. You pursue righteousness. So we've talked about this before, I think. But, but does anyone know what someone's life would look like if in everything that they did, they did it righteously? What we know from Boaz's life is that he acted righteously, but he was still a sinner. And we know this because everyone has sinned, and as good as an example as Boaz is, he was still a human being that had human problems, faced human temptations, and sinned. The book of Ruth was not written to point out his imperfections, but to give us an example of a man that fears the Lord, who acts righteously, and is a portrayal of God's redeeming love for his people. So what we do need to rem remember is that the righteous are not perfect. To act righteously does not mean that you are perfect. Psalm 32 has a good example of this. Here's what David says in the first two verses. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And then later in verses 10 and 11, he says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So if we follow David's train of thought here, he says that the one who has had their transgressions forgiven whose sin has been covered, that man or that person is blessed. Blessed also is the man that the Lord counts no iniquities against. So three times in two verses, David uses a different word for sin, and each moment involves the Lord's forgiveness of sin. Because who can forgive sin? Ultimately, we cannot do it. Only God can. The Lord has a steadfast love that surrounds those that trust the Lord. And so, in verse 11, who are the ones that are righteous and the ones that are upright in heart? They are the ones that trust in the Lord, the ones whose sins are covered and transgressions are forgiven. So to be upright in heart, that does not mean that you are perfect. But, but it does mean that, that, there is real, that you are real, that you pursue the uprightness of heart. There's no deceit in, in your spirit, which means that, that we're not acting hypocritically. We are, the, the, these people, they are righteous because they are trusting the Lord. And when you live your whole life trusting in Him, pursuing the blessedness of being forgiven, your actions are going to naturally reflect the righteousness of God. Now, this does not mean that you are perfect, 
But what it does mean is that you know that you are forgiven, that your sins have been atoned for, that the Lord has surrounded you with his steadfast love. That, and so we can shout for joy to the Lord. And when all of this comes together, when all of this happens, we don't have a perfect man or woman, but we do have a man or a woman that longs to be made righteous, to look like the Lord. So you're not going to do everything perfectly, but you can still learn to act righteously. Now, one of the main themes in the book of Ruth is God's providential care. And what this means is not so much that God provides basic needs for Ruth and Naomi, which he does, but that's not the main thing. God instead supplies exactly what is needed in a timing that was absolutely perfect. And we know from reading the Bible that God's timing is perfect. He lives outside of time, so he knows exactly when and how to act at any given moment. He sees the beginning from the end, and he just knows all. From chapters 1 to chapter 4, everything happens perfectly according to his timing. In the waiting, he is providing what was necessary for Ruth and Naomi. Now, things don't often happen when we think that they should happen, right? Uh... Now, does this mean that they happened on accident, or that, or, or do we think that God had a purpose for revealing things to us when he does? So not to outline the whole book of, of everything that happens um, exactly when it needs to happen, but everything from the famine to the death of Naomi's husbands and sons, to the meeting of Boaz, to the, the Redeemer process, everything is happening according to God's divine wisdom and perfect timing. Now, naturally, we're, we're limited in our understanding, so we don't always understand how God's timing works. And to be honest, it's not really for us to understand. And we couldn't really process everything that is going on when it comes to God's timing. There's so many things that needed to happen, that needed to come together in order for the love story of Ruth and Boaz to happen, that it couldn't just happen by chance. God used a famine, a hardworking Moabite woman, and the plans of an old mother-in-law to perfectly do his will. There's an old Cadman's Call song, and none of you watching this have probably ever heard of Cadman's Call, but I love Cadman's Call. And in the, one of these songs, uh, it, the, the, the song says, You know the plans that you have for me, and you can't plan the end and not plan the means. So what this means is that God's timing is perfect, not just in the end goal. It is perfect every step along the way until we get to that end goal. So there are a lot of hurdles that Ruth had to jump through to get to the end of her story. But all of these things were done through God's goodness. Here's a young lady that lost her home, her husband, her way of life, and yet she remained faithful to Naomi. There's an important verse in verse 13 where it says, The Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. So Ruth, we know, didn't have any children with her first husband. And it sounds like it wasn't because she didn't want them. It was because she couldn't have any. But in the Lord's timing, we see him giving her a son through Boaz. God was working in the bitter setbacks of Ruth's life. You know, all too often, we get impatient waiting for God's timing or with God's timing. But what we see in Ruth's life is that despite the setbacks of her own life, God was working in miraculous ways. If Ruth had children right when she wanted to, there would be no story of Boaz. There would be no birth of Obed. There would be no birth of King David. God was doing everything according to his timing in the way that it needed to be done. John Piper says the life of the godly is not a straight line to glory, but God sees that they get there. So if you're getting impatient with God's timing, trust him to know what is best for you in the long run. We may have to wait to see exactly what he is doing, but there's a purpose wherever you are supposed to go, whatever you are supposed to have, God will make sure that you get it when you need it. Not only does God's provision of Ruth show his perfect timing, it shows that he is a God for the outsiders and for those that think that they are unlovable. So one of the last things that we can see here by the end of Ruth 4 is that there is a triumph at the end of trials. As hard as Naomi and Ruth's lives were, we see that both of them were overjoyed with the new lives that the Lord had given them. So what's kind of weird is that Naomi becomes this key figure in the last half of these verses. I think this happens partially because she is the one that has been changed the most through this entire experience. No longer does she want to be known as Mara like she did in chapter 1 or Bitter. She wants to be known as Naomi because she's living like a Naomi. In fact, the whole neighborhood starts to notice that there's been a change in her. The child that the Lord had given to Ruth, and his husband that's been given to her, have all shown the Lord's provisions for Naomi. She's finally seeing that there is a purpose behind the trials and not, and, and not there. Uh, let's, let's rewind that. She's finally seeing that there's a purpose behind the trials. And finally, there is triumph. Now, if you remember where we started in Ruth, 
I told you that the book was not written in Ruth's lifetime. It was written much later, probably during the reign of King David or maybe even after his death. In verse 17, we read, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So there was a coming king that Naomi and Ruth didn't know about. The book of Ruth ends with the biggest triumph of all when we see that all of this happened in order that David would one day be born. Now, the verses don't say that, that any of David's older brothers were born. It focuses solely on him. Naomi and Ruth, they were overjoyed at the birth of Obed. And here they are, are, here they are they're being the grandparents of King David. But here's the thing. We know that there was one other king, one greater king that would come much later that was worthy of far more praise and honor than David ever was. We know from history that David was in the family line of Jesus. The story of Ruth is so important that, that she is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus that is recorded in Matthew 1. In fact, verses 18 through 22 of Ruth 4 are pretty much copy and pasted into Matthew 1. God used the family of Ruth to be the family that would birth his own son here on earth. So unto us was born the King of kings and Lord of lords. And like the women in, uh, say in verse 14, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. So we know the Lord has not left us without a Redeemer. He has come to be our kinsman Redeemer. Our old husband's sin has died. Now we can faithfully enter into the hands of our Redeemer. So it's incredible to see how God used events to shape the history of the world. Through Ruth, a Moabite widow, God has changed the course of human history by the birth of his son. So trust in the Lord's timing. As we can see here in the book of Ruth, it is absolutely perfect. And as we see with, with uh, the birth of Jesus, for t in, in God's viewpoint of time, everything happens almost in a moment to where he knows the, the, the beginning from the end. So where we might feel like we're kind of stuck in this, uh, kind of like what theology calls the already but not yet, where we're, we're kind of hoping for this... Uh, you know, not yet moment of being with the Lord. I mean, the Lord already knows that moment. He already has uh, decreed that moment to happen. And so we will get there. Uh, we need to trust in the Lord's timing because we know that it is absolutely perfect. So right there is the book of Ruth in four very short weeks. And so uh, now I can turn off the camera and hopefully say I will see you in person uh, within the next couple of weeks for our first YC back and we will be going through the book of Genesis which I am really excited about uh, and we will probably be done with it uh, by Christmas so hopefully that doesn't scare you too much uh, when I first started uh, outlining the, the series for Genesis uh, it was going to take a lot longer than that so uh, anyways I look forward to seeing you all uh, hopefully in the next couple weeks and uh, yeah, I guess I will turn the camera off for the last time for YC videos. So I will see you eventually.